All right, for our audience at home, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your films? Uh, Shanice, the floor is yours. Okay, hi, my name is Shanice C.L. Coleman. My film is Radio Theater for Your Soul, a docu-story, and it's about the making of my internet radio show with the same name. And it kind of goes through the journey of that and it showcases short storytellers of all genres of storytelling and my journey of doing it for four seasons at Accelerated Radio. Awesome, Glenn? Uh, I'm Glenn Austin Anderson uh, and I'm the director at Coogan's Way. It's, uh, it's a feature length, uh, 67 minute film uh, about a little bar that um, meant a lot to its neighborhood. I think that's the best way to put it. <laughs> I love Coogan's. Coogan. <laughs> I loved Coogan's. Yeah, I loved it. Is it still there? Uh, I'm no, sorry. Uh, no, sadly. Um, uh, and that's uh, sort of what happens with the film. But uh, um, Shanice, I'll send you a link. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm, yeah, I want to see it. I want to see it. <laughs> so, 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 Glenn, tell us a little bit about the neighborhood and what Coogan's was and what it really meant to, you know, visitors, but also to the, the residents of that area. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Washington Heights is um, Upper Manhattan. It is, um, I, I like to say it starts around 168th Street um, and or centered around 168th Street and that right there on that corner you'll find the Armory Foundation which is a track and field center so there's a lot of young athletic youth vibe. You'll find uh, Columbia University's medical and public health and dental campus and in and amongst this area that had a very rough time in the 1980s and early 1990s with um, the crack cocaine epidemic, it had a rough time with um, police community relations. In and amongst this largely Dominican neighborhood, you have this Irish bar, this Irish pub. And, you know, a lot of people will say that having a, having a pub in your neighborhood or having a bar in your neighborhood is, is going to bring down um, the atmosphere of a neighborhood, but um, this little Irish pub became a force for good. It became uh, the center of the uh, political life in Upper Manhattan. It became a center for cultural life in Upper Manhattan. It became a place where people felt safe and it didn't ma matter the color of your skin, the cultural or religious background you had, everyone was welcome. So it, it was a really special place and to it was a very special place to a lot of New Yorkers and they've had a really wild last three years and I have been able to um, have my camera and have my team there to film everything that happened over the last three years. Awesome. So when, when you approach the owners of the bar, you know, and the establishment, Hey, I want to bring my camera in. I really want to document this where they're like, you know, why you're crazy, you know, or you were sugar, you know, <laughs> or, or, or they were they really welcoming, you know, because, you know, while this is a local story, you know, I mean, I'm a big fan of New York City. I mean, Shonice is a big fan of New York City. She's a I big am. fan of the bar. So, you know, what was the reaction when you came in there says, I want to do this? So I actually knew Peter um, ahead of time. And that was sort of one of the impetus that, you know, uh, I, I'm a former track and field athlete. And then my first real adult job was at the Armory Foundation, which was sort of Coogan's backyard. Um, I worked there uh, part time while I was going to film school at NYU and uh, and I was in love with this place and I knew Peter passively like oh hey that's Peter the guy who owns Coogan's. Um, but I had moved to Washington DC in 2009 to um, take a staff job at a uh, at uh, the Guardian and I just kept on finding better and unique opportunities here in the Washington DC area and I made my home here. And then, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you get a little bit of news from your hometown and it hits you right in the chest and you go, ah. Oh. So I was reading this running blog, very popular running bar, blog called letsrun.com and they said Coogan's is closing. And this was in January of 2018 and my heart broke. So many good times, so much um, of my 20s was spent in that place. Um, and um, I was sort of following along with the action. I signed the petition that I feature in the film, but when they came up for air after being uh, saved from the massive rent hike they were facing, I said, somebody's got to put this story to film. And I think that somebody's me. Uh, I reached out to Peter and I said, uh, 
I don't know if you remember me. I was a lot younger and a lot skinnier the last time we talked, but um, can I come tell this story? And I knew I was in for, uh, for quite a ride when the first conversation I had with Peter lasted three and a half hours. So uh, I knew I was, I knew I was going to get plenty of stories. If anything, it would be having to trim down. Our original intention was to tell this as a short. We were going to cap out at 40 minutes. Um, but uh, I think- Can't do it. Can't, can't do it. it. <laughs> there was just too much story there. Too much there there, as they say in journalism. Yeah. You know, well, while well, making this documentary, you know, and you lived in New York City and you know this and, you know, you now live in Washington, D.C. Are you kind of seeing the Irish pub of a way that kosher delis have been going? You know, the kosher delis have been declining for so many years. And, you, you know, I live here in Texas and it's not really a good kosher or Jewish deli, yeah. you know, here in Texas. There's this one down in Houston that's been on um, the documentary Deli Man. But are you finding that Irish pubs and establishments like this are kind of going the way that the Jewish deli started to go 20 years ago? I think it's true of almost all small business, especially those cultural touchstone businesses, the Jewish deli, the Irish pub. But I see this happening to a lot of small businesses. The, the, my wife and I met at a, a dive bar. There's no better way to describe it. We met at a dive bar um, just south of DuPont Circle in DC and it's closed. Um, and I think the pandemic is accelerating this, the, the, yeah. this trend where um, these beautiful, incredible, you know, independent businesses are just disappearing and, and it's sad. Uh, and particularly the ones that keep you in touch with some sort of uh, culture, it, it, it's very sad. Um, I'm, it's probably can tell from my name, I, I'm of Scandinavian extraction. And I think there's one Scandinavian bakery left in Brooklyn and it's, uh, you know, uh, my family and I trek there every uh, Christmas time to get our Klingala and to get our, our, our traditional things. But, you know, one Christmas trip a year is not going to support that business. So it's, it's, it's hard. Um, it, it's hard out there. And I, I think this COVID epidemic has only made it worse. You know, you know, this straight smarts, a company, you know, finally moved out of the Lower East Side after yeah. you know almost 100 years so shanice am, am i saying that your name right shanice shanice, shanice? Uh, yeah the o is like ah uh. so tell me about your radio program you know you're doing this radio program and what drove you to say hey i need to do a documentary okay i have to say something to glenn first though no so do please do this, this was not cool. by accident that we we're paired here i don't know who <laughs> paired us but i too worked at the track and field center the no armory. kidding Yes, and I, I was one of the track announcers there for, I, so I'm New York, LA, New York, LA. I've kind of gone back and oh forth and when I went back. Yeah, yeah. This, this was written in the stars. I love this. Uh, and and I lived in Washington people. Heights too. Yeah, so. A lot of great people <laughs> pass through the armory and a lot of great people pass through Washington Heights. It's, it's, yes. a, it's such a cool part of town. Yes, I feel like I'm I'm in in the company of New York right now. <laughs> so, but I'm in LA. But about my radio show. So in 2015, I had moved back to LA and have been back here for a few years. And I was trying to figure out what 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 was I going to do artistically because I as an actor I was not booking anything, and I literally was like meditating, laying on the floor, and I had a vision to to do a radio show and not directly the radio show, but to, I was directed to the internet station, Accelerated Radio. So I started doing some research on that and I was like, I don't wanna do radio, I'm not interested. But I was talking to my talent manager and she said, I've been trying to get you to host. I've been trying to get you to do something. Why don't you look into it? I did. I was like, oh, it costs, it costs money to do it. You can't just do this for free at this particular network. And I decided to just try a, a Kickstarter campaign, got a lot of support, started it, didn't know what I was gonna do really, except for I knew I wanted to deal specifically with storytellers and storytellers from all genres, not just actors or writers, but musicians, anybody who had a story to tell, because I am a believer that everybody has a story to tell. So I initially opened it up to people I knew and was thinking, oh, we'll read like a couple of plays or a book and maybe some poets, because I'm also a poet. And people just started asking to come on the show. 
And so weekly, every Saturday, we would do this radio show at the network, at the studios, Accelerated Radio. And the people who came kept wanting to come back. And it turned into more of a a place to gather. So I call it a gathering. It was radio theater for you. So where storytellers gather around the mic. So we gathered every Saturday. It was planned as to who would come, but it was not planned as to how many would come. And I didn't know how long I would do it, but I did it for two years, which I called four seasons. And it <laughs> just turned into like this thing, but it was overwhelming. When I say it was overwhelming, it was just me. There were people helping, but it was me kind of setting it up and prepping people as to what I thought would be good for the listeners to hear because it was radio. I was like, let me push the listening because we always are looking at, at visuals and we get a, a, we become prejudging. We judge, prejudge people when we see them. So I was like, I'm really going to push the listening. Although the storytellers were like, well, I want to do, you know, Skype, let's put it on Facebook live. Let's do this. And the studio provided some of that, but I was like, no, let's just listen. Let's listen. <laughs> we'll get more people to tune in if we listen, because they will look at you and say, I don't want to, I don't want to hear this story and, or, or whatever they would say. So I thought it would be um, good to just have them do the listening. So long story short, we got to seasons two or three and I was like, this is exhausting. I don't know how long I'm going to do it. I'm going to take a hiatus soon. So after um, we got to 2017, midway through 2017, I was like, 2016, I was like, okay, I'm going to take hiatus and I'll come back. The poets specifically were like, please come back. We, we want to come back on. They wanted to come on every week. And I was like, okay, I get that this is bigger than me. I get that this is about a healing space, is a, is a place for people to express themselves. It is a place for people to, to get fed. And I just knew it was more than I could do at the time. So I took a break, I took a hiatus. And during the hi hiatus, it came to me to do a documentary. Like I did not plan to do a documentary. You put I more work it. on your plate. I mean, right. Well, you know, this is crazy. <laughs> all I just, all I wanted to do was give back when I had pictures because everything in the documentary is archival, with the exception of the narration that I add and a few talking heads. But the photos that we took in studio were for the storytellers so they can get something in turn for sharing their story. The video clips, some of them asked for it. And so that's kind of how I said, I have, I have footage, you know, maybe I'll give them this gift of, of a documentary. And I, and in that I was like, maybe I can be seen now too as an actor <laughs> and put myself out there and see other things that I can do. So people can see my personality besides on hearing it on the radio. And thus came Radio Theater for Your Soul, a docu-story. And it's not, we're not doing it now. I, I basically told everybody that I'm still on hiatus because I don't know how I want to go back and do it again. I do know that I want to do it again, but not exactly the right. way it has been done. So not so I'm exhausted, <laughs> you know. Such a wonderful documentary. And, you know, a lot of documentaries think they have to have moving pictures. And I think with you, you've proven that you can with audio, with sound and with still photos that mm -hmm. you can still, you know, convey, convey a really good story. Thank so you. Glenn, at the end yes. of your documentary, you dedicate it to a gentleman. So tell us who he is and, and, you know, so we can, you know, continue to, you know, bless his memory. Oh, you're going to get me dewy eyed here, Dev. Um, Jim Dwyer um, is a two time Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter. Um, the, one of the smartest and most connected men in New York City. Um, he's an in intrinsic part of my story. Um, he wrote the articles that really called attention to what was happening um, with Coogan's and their that massive rent hike, drew the attention to the issue. Um, I didn't know Jim well, but the short interactions I had with him in making the film, he could not have been more giving of his time, disposition, his Rolodex, his resources. And um, unfortunately, uh, pretty early on, we lost Jim. Um, uh, um, 
in the co- it, it, he did not die from COVID as I understand it, but um, he died around when people were losing their lives for COVID, um, and he was suffering from another malady and access to care, um, you know, was one of the big issues early in COVID. What do we do about the people who are already being treated? So um, I don't know the specifics of, of uh, his final days, but I um, we felt it was right, my team and I, to dedicate the film to Jim because um, he just was one of the great New Yorkers, truly one of the great New Yorkers, uh, um, first generation American, Irish American, and he loved the neighborhood. He loved that bar. He loved New York. And um, so do we. So we had to say, um, if, if there was anybody who was going to get that dedication, it was going to be Jim Dwyer. And uh, his family has been incredible. I think that I think they are have been the biggest fans of the film. Um, they have just been incredibly supportive of this. So uh, I, I feel like an honorary Dwyer. They've been really mm-hmm. great to me. And uh, um, really great and just saying some really nice things about the film and uh, yeah um, they don't make them like Jim and I was very flattered to to get to interview him and he actually told me at the end of our interview you're pretty good at this and to get that from a two uh, two-time Pulitzer winner that, that that's Gold. that's intense yeah I mean we have like award-winning actors we have a little tiny cameo from Lin-Manuel Miranda we have a uh, we have a um, you know, Jared Harris did our voiceovers. We, there's star power in the film, but uh, Peter Walsh, one of my subjects, and I went, you know, the biggest star power in this might actually be Jim Dwyer. Um, because uh, amongst certain New Yorkers, he's a, he's a very important figure. You know, and may his memory always be a blessing oh, through your you. film and, you know, throughout his, his career. And, you know, may we never forget him. So Shanice, I, I got to ask, so you're a very giving person. You know, you told us a story about your radio show, how you wanted to give back. So what did you learn professionally and personally about your life? You know, what did you learn, you know, about yourself going through this journey of, you know, staring at the ceiling fan or at the wall or whatnot and coming with this idea and then going through this journey? Hmm. That's a great question. I think I... Probably I learned a lot of things, but one of the things I know I learned was if you get still long enough and you just listen to the inner voice, you'll hear where it is, what you're supposed to do next. And I don't know if I paid attention when I was younger to my inner voice. I think I just kind of did whatever was seemed like the next thing to do or what someone told me to do or the trend. And this made me get still. And I did learn also, which is a big thing as well, how to communicate with all walks of life. And I like to think I'm a people person, but I wouldn't necessarily, everybody on the show, I did, not know, I did not know before they came on the show. And I wouldn't necessarily interact with them outside of the show had I not met them um, through someone or with them reaching out to come on the show. So I, I expanded my, my personal um, uh, prejudices, I'll say, and I've expanded my my sense of uh, listening in a way that I, I knew I wanted to, but I didn't know I wasn't the best listener in the world. You know, you can't tell me I wasn't a good listener until I got on that show. And a lot of times it was after I listened to the shows outside of being there in the studio when I listened after that it, it really um, kind of hit me how sharing a story just really does, it, it does something for us, you know, and it did a lot for me. Um, it did a lot for me and, and, and in a healing place that I didn't even know needed healing. And I also know that, that it did that for a lot of the people who were on the show and those who listened because I got emails and people reached out different kind of ways to kind of tell me that, so. Yeah, I think that was that's the biggest part of it is the inner voice and the and the healing from listening and 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 other people 
being able to be open to other people that I wouldn't normally be open to, even as an artist, because most people think that artists are just get along with everybody and we don't, you know, we get along with who we like or who likes us. And in this case, it's like, it's not, it wasn't about me. It was about letting this person share their story and learning something from the story that I would not have listened to otherwise. Awesome. We're going to leave it at that. I really do appreciate the both of you taking your time out on Mother's Day to join me and congratulations on two great films. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Take care.